Mountain lions in Pacifica, is it true? Could it be possible? And what do we do about it? That's the show tonight on Pacifica Currents. Pacific Occurrence. My name is Steve Johnson, the host of tonight's show. The theme of tonight's show is the California mountain lion. Now, no, no doubt over time you've heard stories about the California mountain lion coming into urban areas of the Bay Area. And questions come up such as, why are they coming into urban areas? And how many, uh, how many of these animals are there? And what do they eat? And how can we protect them? So to answer all these questions, we've invited Zara McDonald to come. And Zara, welcome to Pacific Occurrence. It's very nice to see you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for coming. And perhaps we could start off by uh, letting us know how you got involved with uh, big cats. So I had two encounters, and one in particular was quite close up. I am a long distance runner. I run trails exclusively, and that happens to be mountain lion habitat. So. Uh, distance you are from me was how far away the lion was on that particular evening really? at dusk. Yes, and I was alone and running alone, which I should not have been. However, uh, the encounter ended up being a, just a spectacular experience of sorts, but we stared each other down very briefly. Seemed like forever to me. He became disinterested and t turned around and walked away flipped away actually, his tail disappeared into the bush. That experience uh, subsequently stayed with me um, in a very deep way. And it moved me to do a number of things and one of them was to start Felly Day. And what was the purpose of, of this organization? I mentioned that it's uh, both conservation and education, but could you expand on that a little bit? Yes, it's actually research, conservation and education. So one of the things we, seek to do with our, with our role in this space is to disseminate the science, disseminate the scientific information for the public, for education, conservation, and also use scientific data that we acquire through the projects that we launch and partner in to inform conservation, teach kids, adults, communities, and change the way people view wild cats. Uh, can you give us some idea about how big they are and what their range is and what they eat? Specifically the mountain lion, puma, cougar, catamount, shadow cat, more names than any other mammal. Hmm. Mountain lion has a place in the Guinness Book of World Records for the number of names it has. No kidding. Yeah, and so often people get confused that the cougar and the puma and the mountain lion are the same animal, and they absolutely are. This cat is uh, native to the Americas, the largest range of any terrestrial mammal except for humans. Historically, um, they've existed through North, Central, South America. Males can go up to over 220 pounds. They're typically the size of a large dog. Females start around 60 pounds depending on the region. So they're larger near the poles and smaller near the equator. They're incredible jumpers, vertically up to 20 feet in one leap. Wow. Horizontally 20 to 30 feet across a horizontal space. It's quite a, quite a sight to see. So the way they evolved was to ambush their prey. And what that requires is quite a long leaping jump to the back of the prey to bite the back of the neck. So they can go for fast bursts, but very short, and then they exhaust pretty quickly. These cats were found all over North America, but you don't hear about them much on the East Coast. 
they were uh, largely extinct on the East Coast by 1900. So this was due to bounty hunting and um, bounties offered throughout the eastern states. They were almost uh, extirpated in California. And in the 70s, there was uh, some concern on the part of the Reagan administration, the government uh, at the time. And they, they subsequently issued a moratorium on killing mountain lions. And so uh, there was a lot of effort that ensued over the next uh, couple of decades, after which uh, the mountain lion was deemed a specially protected mammal through a lot of work on, a, on the part of a number of individuals and groups, Mountain Lion Foundation being one, to pass uh, Proposition 117 in 1990. And so that is its current status today, specially protected mammal. And what's the difference between the male and female? The female are pregnant or raising young most of their lives. And that's an issue, especially when a puma is killed. So if a female is killed, the chances are very good that she's either pregnant or raising young, dependent young. We will lose three, four lives by killing that one female. Wow. Well, this leads to the question about the uh, puma's role in the ecosystem. And I know you've done a lot of research on this. And perhaps you could tell us something why, why they're so important in the in the greater scheme of things. Right, top-down regulator, keystone species. You remove the keystone from the building, it just falls apart. The cat sits at the top of the food chain. It's an apex predator. It's, um, it's the apex of this tremendously intricate food chain. And by its mere existence, it is regulating and balancing that ecosystem. If you remove that predator, a number of really terrible things happen. And we're just really now learning some of those things. Uh, deer populations rise dramatically without the apex predator. The other key and important point is that mountain lions prey on weak and diseased, weak and diseased prey. So once you know, they remove that from the system, they're keeping it healthy just by their mere presence. So if that lion's not around to do that, the disease is going to proliferate and through the system and rise. So we have a, a much higher rate of Lyme disease on the East Coast. And this is one of those reasons is we don't have this sort of balancer of the prey numbers. And uh, the other really important thing that we're learning much about is when the deer, there's sort of this process of unchecked deer without a, a predator in the system. So when you imagine deer just feeding and moving through the landscape without fear, without looking over their shoulder for that predator, they feed that ground cover to the bottom. So they're subsequently removing habitat for a number of species, songbirds, sage grouse, a number of species that actually require that for survival. So, so it's California quail, you know, our state bird, yep, they're in, endangered yep, because of this? Exactly. So. It's, it's especially important that the deer are not rising in numbers to a point where it's unhealthy for that system, but also that the lions, there are enough lions to help keep those numbers in check. And previously wolves, we have no wolves anymore, so um, we never know what's gonna happen up in the northern part of California anymore because we have that one, but we absolutely need the predator in the system. Well, this, this influences other animals, too, because um, I think you've mentioned in, in previous uh, speeches where uh, the mountain lion kind of shares its food with other predators. Um, right. It doesn't eat everything all, all, all at once, and sometimes it's food left for other animals. When we think about what they eat prey-wise, mouse to moose. So we're li literally talking about everything in between. And we know of certain mountain lions that will feed particularly on porcupine on wild ho feral horses. Yeah, it's, it's very, but it's all related to the situation in that area or region they're living in. Their primary prey is deer. I mean, 85% of that diet is deer. However, um, when they need to, they can prey on rabbits and fox and bobcats and coyotes. They will take down a deer typically and feed on it for a period of time, and that period could be a day, two, three, and they might rest close by or they might lie next to it after feeding. Um, if they leave it, they'll usually cache it 
planning to come back, so they'll cover it with um, leaves and brush to protect it, keep the scent in, protect it from other predators so they can come back and feed. But when they leave, three, four, maybe five days later, they actually uh, leave that prey to be consumed by a spectrum of other species in the ecosystem. Now there's something called encroachment we've mentioned in previous uh, speeches. Can you tell us more about what that means? It's quite important. Uh, it's all about humans. So as we, our population grows and continues to expand, our communities further develop, we build uh, more buildings, residential communities, roadways. Right up into the hills. You bet, and the wildlife is compromised, and specifically a, a wide-ranging predator such as the mountain lion. So they require vast amounts of space, and they require movement. One of the problems that we're seeing with this encroachment is they can't move as they would naturally. So they're being trapped uh, by barriers such as roadways, um, towns, residential communities, fences, and it's become a, a serious issue. And so, of course, this will lead to a, a severe drop in genetic diversity, which, again, will lead to local extinctions. And you're currently working with Caltrans, right, to find ways of getting around this problem of crossing roadways. Yes, so we are in discussions on, in providing our data, what we will, um, what this is, intended to lead to, and Caltrans seems very willing to work with us on this, is uh, retrofitting roadways in such a way where culverts are opened up so that wildlife can move underneath. F directional fencing will keep animals from popping up in the roadways and trying to cross on busy roadways. And uh, we can also clear out areas of culverts where if they're too overgrown, we've found that wildlife will not move through. So there are simple things that really don't cost a lot of money that uh, can have a tremendous impact on the movement of wildlife. Well, I read something that over 100 mountain lions are killed every year, uh, some by roadkill and uh, some by uh, permit. Can you tell us about these, these permits? Yes, uh, depredation permit is issued in California if a, a resident, a hobby animal owner, a rancher, or a person simply with a pet, dog, cat, uh, if that animal's killed by a mountain lion, the, uh, I, I or you can call Fish and Game and have them issue me a permit to have that cat killed, whether I do it or they do it. It's not a very, it, it's a very incomplete type of um, law and situation at this stage. Uh, it's to way too many animals are being killed this way and mountain lions are often erroneously identified as the culprits when it's um, oftentimes coyotes, even bobcats, taking some of the livestock and hobby animals. So our goal is to educate, to work with the ranchers closely, to change this and teach them ways we can prevent be uh, the deaths on both sides. And you're also working with law enforcement agencies so that they uh, have training and perhaps can find other ways of dealing with the situation rather than just shooting the animal outright. So we are working with, again, a number of partners to work up this protocol that we can actually take throughout communities in California to law enforcement agencies and have them well trained with dart guns and protocol to, to understand when a lion that's in the neighborhood is threatening, when it's not. Because oftentimes, if a lion's in a community, number one, they don't want to be there. Number two, if there is a way out, they would take it. And they are petrified. You can be guaranteed. So I have uh, been in the field for the last decade with these animals, sometimes with only one other person. We have never had a lion come towards either of us, any of us at all. And we have, we have been in their space, so you know, sort of messing with them, and they still don't do it. So when, they're in the, when they are in our communities, what's happening, more often than not, is we have a dispersing young male or female looking for a new home range. And so they've butted right up next to our communities. It's the encroachment issue again. They have no way to move through. There's no pathway. And so they get stuck. 
And if a human sees them, it becomes now a public safety event. Even if they try to get out, it might be too late. Well, this leads to the big question uh, that might come up um, if you're out in a rural area and you're jogging or walking, whatever, and you do see a mountain lion, what should you do? Well, that depends. So it depends on a number of things. It depends on whether you're alone. It depends on how far away the lion is. Uh, most of the time, sightings that I hear about, the most people see is a tail disappearing into a bush. Uh, if it's a cat, if it's actually a cat in front of you moving towards you, it's um, it's something to pay attention to. Uh, it's very rare, likely will never happen. Um, they would usually run the other direction. Again, they want nothing to do with us. Um, but I think the most important message when we are out there sharing the space with this wildlife is to be aware. You know, really be in tune to the setting, the surroundings, and aware of everything that's moving. And if you see a lion, you're actually very fortunate. The cats are not after us. We're not on their menu. And uh, they'll likely, it will be a very quick flash, and it will be gone. Um, I think there's far, the problem with the lions is it evokes fear because it's a predator. And people think, okay, there are lions out there, I'm going to be attacked. The fear is greatly exaggerated. It's not realistic. And it's very rare that a lion will have any interest in a human to begin with. Um, they know what their prey species are, and they're not humans. You should go out there and recreate and feel comfortable, but be aware, as you should be in any setting. And you're actually in more danger from humans than you are from any wildlife. But just, just for precaution's sake, you, you want to, uh, probably not a good idea to go out jogging alone. And it's probably not a good idea to go jogging in the early morning or late evening, because that's when they're most common to be out there, right? Dusk to dawn, yeah. The most active hours for these, these cats, uh, they usually sleep several hours during the day. They're moving actively at night and um, seeking prey at that time. So they're largely on the move. Um, dusk and dawn are, are, yeah, times to be careful. And yeah. I've read that you should be uh, loud and uh, pump yourself up and, and yell. and. So it, it, the, making noise is a little unnecessary because they see you long before you even would ever know they're there. So they've They've got great senses. Um, their sensory perception is obviously important for them for survival. So uh, making noise is not so important. If you actually see one and you feel threatened, yes, appearing big, arms up, whatever you got on your, on your body, a water bottle, a backpack, and you need to throw it, you throw it. Because uh, if you fight back, chances are very good they will take off. How many of these sightings that, that are reported are actually of mountain lions? 85 to 90 percent of all sightings are actually not mountain lions and really? this is a fish and game statistic. I like to share that because I have numerous stories shared with me by audience members and community members describing their sightings and it's, it's actually very interesting because even people who are very familiar in the field will have erroneous sightings, simply because it depends on the angle you're at, how far away it is. There are a lot of reasons why you could think you see a mountain lion when you actually see a coyote or a dog or a bobcat. And so it's especially important to be um, cognizant of the fact that this is very common. And not just by people who don't understand. By very experienced people, sightings are often not correct. Well, I was surprised when I saw a bobcat at Point Reyes one time how big they were. But then I looked at its tail, and it had a small, short tail, and right. I knew it wasn't a mountain lion. Because, you know, perspective has something to do with it, too, because it was far away. But uh, I looked at the tail. That's a, give a giveaway, isn't it? Yes, and so that's a distinguishing characteristic. The mountain lion has a long, cylindrical, thick tail, um, most often a dark tip at the end, a very defining characteristic in the mountain lion. It's also quite a bit larger. And if you think about a large dog, it's, um, it doesn't have spots. Mountain lion kittens do. But again, the kittens have a long tail. So 
it's, it's one way to know that you're seeing a bobcat, a mountain lion, kitten, mountain lion. Very different. Now, your organization has done a lot of research about these cats. Can you tell us something about what this research consists of? We have a particular project of interest locally in the Bay Area that was launched uh, about a little over three years ago called the Bay Area Puma Project. And uh, this is one of several mountain lion research efforts we have ongoing um, throughout its range. This project in particular is combining research, education, and outreach, and some uh, component of citizen science. And we want this model to sort of become a norm where we can use the research data to inform all of these other components and modules. And in particular, um, the research is actually informing us on an urban carnivore and the challenges that face an urban carnivore such as the mountain lion. So in particular in the San Francisco Bay region we have three very different regions sort of around San Francisco and very different ecosystems and settings. We have the Santa Cruz Mountains in the south and then we have a range from uh, over sort of we call it the East Bay but the Diablo range and down through the Hamilton and the Gavilan range. So these are all prime habitats in some fashion for lion populations. The key issue for these lions is how do they connect and how do they cross our crazy roadways, our 101 freeway, and how do they move around or through our communities to connect to remain healthy as populations. So these are, this is a typical camera that we'll place in the field to capture remote images of lions moving, and uh, we'll also capture a number of other wildlife species. Uh, we capture bobcats, coyotes, fox, raccoons, um, sometimes the occasional ringtail, but it's, these are basically set up, as you can tell from this uh, camouflage, to be stealthy. We can place them so that they're not so noticeable, and they can tell us uh, quite a bit about the population, individuals, who's moving through in particular areas, and then also where the barriers are stopping them, and so where the troubles are for them to move in, in a normal, natural fashion for them. So the way that works is um, it, it, the animal goes by, it triggers a flash, takes the picture, and anytime there's movement, it's gonna take a, a picture. Right, and we can set it at different uh, trigger speeds so that we could get a number of, we get a sequence of pictures, or we can take video, and we get some really nice videos from this, but we're really, in some cases, trying to, de to detect presence, non-presence, and then also adding layers of information to that about individuals and behavior. Have you come to any preliminary conclusions yet about um, either the, the pumas that are in Santa, Santa Cruz or the ones over in the East Bay? So it's a little early for East Bay. We have cameras out and we are, so the, the real issue with East Bay is there's a tremendous barrier um, with Highway 580, Freeway 580, and there's a north-south movement. Uh, there's the Caldecott Tunnel as well, which is a, we believe it's a land bridge. We're still, we have a number of cameras up throughout this region right now. And um, it's very early in that process. We'll start our collaring uh, and GPS collar placement of the cats uh, in the next month or so with Fish and Game as a partner. The Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a loose number that Chris Wilmers has come up with, but, you know, I hesitate to throw that out there. I mean, we're, we're looking at probably uh, anywhere from 40 to 90 cats between Santa Cruz Mountains up to San Francisco County. You know, it's hard to say when the overall scheme of things, what would be a, a natural number for those animals? A natural number is uh, females uh, typically require an average of 50 square miles for a home range. Males, 100, 200, depends on how much space they have. How much can we squeeze those home ranges? So this is what we're starting to learn more about is the, the urban fringe and the encroachment are starting to squeeze those really compress them. Females will overlap with each other. Females and males will, will overlap a little bit, but 
there's a point at which you can't push them together anymore because males are not tolerant of sure. one another. So, um, you know, what's natural is really that typical average size allowance um, for, because there's plenty of prey and the prey is not the issue. Movement is the issue. Well, it sounds like this organization that, that you are part of is doing a lot of wonderful things. I'm wondering um, how people could help out, what they can do to, how do they get in touch with you, and what, what sorts of things can they do for your organization? Right, so we have a number of uh, very exciting efforts underway uh, along the education and outreach pathways. We have a CAT Aware education program that's uh, in its third year, very successful. We are reaching uh, K-12 schools throughout the South Bay and now in the East Bay and also the North Bay. And that's growing exponentially. So there's a lot of excitement about that. There are three parts to that, a presentation in the classroom, a predator prey lab, and then we actually take the kids out into the field and they have this experience with field biologists and learn a little bit about what we do oh, in the that's field. that's exciting. It's a great experience for them. And uh, in addition to that, we have um, tracking series with expert trackers. Catscapes has started up in Marin County and we're taking out community members and teaching them sort of how to move on the landscape and, and understand how a cat might move uh, along with other wildlife. So the Bay Area project is, is so important for this region and it will inform the world about San Francisco and how San Francisco is, is acting to protect its keystone species. This is the project where you're tracking the animals and you keeping bet. the data and so on and this is yeah. where uh, you don't have to be a scientist to be part of this. We have a number of volunteers. Some of them are scientists, others are not. Uh, we love to have community involvement. We have great uh, input from community um, citizen science work. People who love to put their own cameras up, we'll work with them, we'll, we'll pull their data. And uh, we actually have a number of uh, efforts on, we're at on all the social network um, channels, so we are on Twitter. All, a lot of our cats have Facebook pages, so you can connect to them, become a fan, and follow them. And uh, we have a number of events where we um, reach out to the community. We teach them about lions, we teach them about the role, we tell them about the biology, the ecology, and the project. And, what is happening with these collared lions? Where are they moving? What are the problems? What are the challenges? Why are they dying? Uh, we have more cats dying than ever from, believe it or not, uh, some of our chemicals that are poisoning them, anticoagulants, rat poisons. Oh, yeah. And so this is becoming more of an issue. And we love to have volunteers work with us. Uh, we are always trying to raise awareness on this project. It's very important for the lions. So these cats uh, really need our help. And we, what I like to express is that everybody can play a role. We have a number of different efforts ongoing where you can become involved and help us. Um, everything from outreach to education to research to money the more you can help us, the better off the lions will actually be in the end. Zara, thank you so much for coming on our show tonight. It was a real pleasure to have you. Thank All you the best to you me. and your organization. And folks, you can always see our show on YouTube on the Pacifica Currents channel. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. We'll see you next time. Good night.